In this video, we're going to be studying the phylum Platyhelminthes, or more commonly referred to as the flatworms. Before proceeding on, make sure that you have the handout from class or the internet ready so that you can fill it in as we go through. As you can see in this diagram, we are still talking about a primitive organism, but the flatworms or the platyhelminthes are going to represent some major advancements over the more primitive cnidarians and sponges. As you can see in this more updated version of the circle of life, or the phylogeny of all life on Earth, we're still talking about primitive organisms, but we're going to have some major advances. The phylum platyhelminthes gets its name from the root platy, which means flat, and helminth, which means worm. Examples of these include liver flukes, pork tapeworms, and planaria. If you look in the corner there, you can see that is a dog tapeworm. Platyhelminthes are going to show three body layers, an epidermis, a gastrodermis, where digestion will occur, and now a mesodermis. In this blue area, we actually have cells here. If you remember back in the cnidarians, we had mesoglia, which was just a matrix of gel. But actual cells now form the mesoderm. Platyhelminthes are generally flat. And most are mobile, or at least in part of their life cycle, they're mobile. Many are parasitic and cycle through different hosts at different parts of their life. And like I mentioned before, this is a dog tapeworm. The phylum platyhelminthes fulfills several ecological roles. Many are predators, some are scavengers, but many are parasites that affect humans and wildlife, as well as livestock that are essential for humans to survive. The picture in the lower left is showing you a liver fluke, and the diagram is showing you a life cycle where that fluke lives in many different hosts throughout its entire life. One example of a parasite is the schistosomiasis parasite. It's the second most harmful parasite after malaria causing extreme organ damage, and can be found in tropical waters that have snail hosts. The lower left is a picture of a human arm, which is showing the little blisters where the parasite has first dug through the skin. And then the picture of the little boy is showing some of the bloating that occurs with some of the organ damage. Schistosomiasis is primarily tropical, with the majority of the infections being found in Africa, parts of Asia, and parts of South America. The schistosomiasis parasite goes through part of its life cycle living in snails and water, and then goes through several parts of the human body as it fulfills its life cycle. So where do platyhelminthes live? Some are freshwater, like planaria that we saw when we did our leaf packs. Some are marine, which are absolutely beautiful. Some are found in moist, humid areas, like leaf litter. And then, of course, the parasites are found inside of organisms. Here's a diagram showing the anatomy of a platyhelminthes. In this case, it's a planaria to be used as an example. But the planaria share many body features with the other platyhelminthes. One important thing to note is that we now have bilateral symmetry. All of the platyhelminthes, whether they're a fluke, an oval, a long tapeworm, or a free-floating, swimming planaria, are all bilaterally symmetrical. Part of being bilaterally symmetrical is to be cephalized, or to have a head. And in this case, you can see the eye spores, or the light-detecting spots, that are found on a planaria. They don't have segmentation, though. Later on, when I should talk about some of the parasites, the tapeworms, they have repeated segments, but it's not in the classic sense of segmentation from an evolutionary sense. In terms of a body cavity, we don't have a true body cavity. Yes, we have a mesoderm, so a space between the organs and the outside, but that's filled with cells and not an open body cavity. So we would call them acelomates.
In terms of the type of gut and digestion, we still have the sac-like gut, the primitive gut with branches, and some of them are going to have a pharynx, a muscular tube that will extend from the body. So while we haven't yet quite involved a complete gut in the organisms we're studying, we do have a digestive cavity, which is more like a sac. In terms of organs, they have both tissues and organs, which are two or more tissues interacting, and organ systems, which are two or more organs that are working together. In terms of respiration, it's simple diffusion through a surface. Now, when some of the platyhelminthes get very large, it's going to keep them flat in order for the serve to be enough surface area for diffusion of carbon dioxide and oxygen. In terms of the nervous system, we see a significant advancement over the cnidaria. Now there are paired ventral nerve cords that are going along the bottom of the body, or what we would call the belly. And there are also these structures called ganglia, or collections of nerves that act as mini brains. In terms of excretion, there are many different types of nitrogenous waste excretion, but many show a, a structure called protonephridia which are tiny tubed branches that connect pores on the surface to flame cells, which are bulb shaped. These flame cells fill with waste and water and then are expelled to the surface. In terms of reproduction, most of them are hermaphroditic with both testes and ovaries, but many can also go undergo asexual fission. In terms of the platyhelminthes, we're going to focus on the three major classes, class turbularia, class trematoda, and class cestoda. Class turbularia is one that you've seen when we did our leaf packs. Here's a picture of the most common type of turbularian that you might encounter, the planaria. One note about the class Turbularia. It seems from recent phylogenetic work that all the species that are commonly referred to as Turbularians did not evolve from one ancestor. But for our purposes, we're going to study them as a group. The class Turbularia gets its name from the small little whirlpools of particles that are often seen swirling around them due to the cilia on their body. The class Turbularia contains the planarians, lots of scavengers, freshwater and marine species, or ones that live in moist, humid land environments. One thing to note if you look in the lower right is that they can be a common pest in fish tanks. So there are different strategies for removing them so that they don't affect the other species living in the tanks. One amazing aspect of the planarians is that they can regenerate. By dividing in half asexually, they can clone themselves. But also, if pieces are cut off, they can divide into two separate clones. They can be split down the middle to form two different heads or have two different tails. Since this is quite a superpower, there's even a comic book series written about planarian man where losing a limb is nothing to him and he can always regenerate. There's quite a pop culture fondness for planarians in the class Turbularia. There's plushies, there's t-shirts, even some funny crossing signs, and some two-headed dividing crocheted creatures. Now let's focus on the second class, the Trematoda. The Trematoda are parasitic flukes, oval in shape with a sucker mouth, they can be found in both sexual and asexual phases of their life. And they go through at least two hosts during their lifetime. Here's a classic example of a liver fluke as it proceeds through livestock, snails, and possibly even humans. As you look, this is a cross-section of a liver showing a parasitic fluke that has been removed. You can see that the larvae lived inside the liver for a quite a long period of time and created a little cyst or an encasement that could help it survive in the organ. 
And finally, we're now to the class Sestota. The class Sestota are the tapeworms. They're intestinal parasites that anchor to the intestine using a scolex, or this region up here, that allows them to stay in the intestines for long periods of time and attain great lengths. One interesting aspect of the cestoda that's different from some of the other species is that they don't have a gut. They just absorb pre-digested material from their host. And this loss of a gut probably happened during evolution because it was already living amongst pre-digested food. Behind the head, which has suckers and hooks and attaches to the wall of the intestine or the other parts of the body of the species, you find these repeating segments called proglottids. Proglottids also have ovaries and testes, which allow the organism to be hermaphroditic and allow it to fertilize itself while it's living inside the host. As you look at an entire tapeworm in the class Cestoda, you might wonder when you're looking at all of these repeated proglottids, where are the oldest ones? Are they up near the red arrow near the scolex, the head, or are they at the end towards the bottom of the video? The oldest ones are found at the end. New ones form directly behind the scolex, and as they age, they get larger and larger, become sexually reproductive. Eventually, the older ones become fertilized, develop eggs, and then break off, leaving the host organism with the feces in order to complete the life cycle in other hosts. One amazing aspect of tapeworms is that this parasite can live in the same host for extremely long periods of time and attain very long lengths. One that most humans think about is either the beef or the pork tapeworm since it can come into our bodies by eating raw or undercooked infected meat. In fact, a pork tapeworm in an adult human could be two to seven meters long and contain a thousand proglottids or 50,000 or more eggs at any one given time. So let's check for our understanding. If you remember back, we have three classes. We have the class Turbularia, we have the class Trematoda, and we have the class Cestoda. So why don't you pause the video here and see if you can identify organism A, organism B, and organism C. So, in other words, what class is each picture in the phylum Platyhelminthes? All right, are you ready for your answers? So, the first one, A, is in the class Cestoda. That's a tapeworm. The Trematoda, or the fluke, is easy to identify by its oval shape, and up near the head on the right-hand side is the sucker. And then in the bottom is the class Turbularia, the free-swimming, free-living Turbularians. Finally, to finish this lesson, complete this coloring assignment in your yellow booklet on page 9. Be sure that you're coloring the correct worms, either the top, middle, or one of the two bottom worms, and make sure that you're only coloring the structures that are shown here. These are crucial to your understanding of the phylum platyhelminthes and working with some of the living and the preserved specimens that we're going to see in class. Finally, I want to dare you to watch some great little video clips of different types of parasites in the phylum platyhelminthes found in the really popular TV show Monsters Inside Me. So after you finish this video, you'll see some links to some of the videos. They're completely optional. You don't have to watch them, but they're really interesting and tell an amazing tale of how these parasitic platyhelminthes can survive in humans.